Hey, we've got a special uh, in-house guest preacher this morning, going to come and share with us something that's on his heart. Let's put our hands together for Bruce. Kids Church. Yes, Kids Church. Let's go. Let's give him a cheer. My, um, for those who don't know, my, my wife, uh, Fleur, says, sends hello to all those people that she knows. <laughs> She's um, currently doing a three-month placement at a, as a volunteer on staff at a church in London, uh, East London, and uh, having a grand old time and doing a bit of touring as well. Um, last night, or early this morning, I guess it was for us, they, her church, she was coordinating a pumpkin party at the church. Um, and, yeah, so they got all the community in and they got pumpkins and gave them a chance to have all these games and got them some people to carve pumpkins for competitions and all sorts of stuff. And then the pastor did a little talk about... He got a pumpkin out the front and he... Um, put a candle in it and then he said you know God wants to come along and scoop out all the junk out of the pumpkin and and put a put the light into your life and Jesus represents light coming into darkness and yeah just a little short message to the community and it was uh, yeah so she coordinated all that back at the beginning of September Alan asked me whether this date would be okay and and we were humming and ahhing I think because Others may not be aware, my wife and I are planning going back to South Australia to be near family um, and weren't quite sure whether I'd still be here. Um, but God in his way has me still here, so um, that must be a purpose to it. Part of it might even been for me, you know, like even putting together today's message. And when you're thinking about a message that might be the last time you preach in the church, uh, uh, I went through about, I've, I've probably prepared seven or eight different sermons across the last six weeks. <laughs> Um, but it has been really good for me, reflecting and getting back into the Word and doing things. So if, no, if nobody else gets anything, I got a lot from it, so that's really good. I've titled today's sermon or message, Who Do You Think You Are? And I'm not asking that question from the perspective of, you know, are you thinking too highly of yourself? Who do you think you are, you know? Or, you know sometimes when we say things or we act in certain ways, people question our authority or our position to be doing those things. Um, Though in some way, I'm going to touch towards the end and suggest maybe we do need to think about who we are in that perspective and that acting small is maybe not what God would have called us to be. Today, though, I'm really asking the question, who do you think you are from the perspective of at the core, your identity? Do you actually... Who do you really think you are at that core? Who is the centre of your life, the identity, the person that you think, this is who I am in this world? Who we think is very important. All our thoughts and beliefs about ourselves creates and shapes a worldview and that worldview is what drives our behaviours and our actions. In Proverbs 23, 7, It's an interesting little proverb and it says, Do not eat the food of a begrudging host or a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies. For he is the kind of person who always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. In some versions it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. You know, uh, this man is a, at, at his heart he's a stingy man. And though he says words to say, come and eat and drink, and in his heart he's really saying, I don't really want you doing that. Um, and he's, what he thinks about is what drives him. When we speak and do things that are not in line with what we really believe, we, we're putting on this certain persona sometimes. And we can, we can front people, you know, we can put on a front and, and indicate we're somebody that we're not. Dalla, Dallas Willard, a theologian, stated, our thoughts are one of the most basic sources of our life. They determine the orientation of everything we do and evoke the feelings that frame our world and motivate our actions. So they seem to have some importance, I think, the way we think about ourselves. What do you believe? 
All our self-views impact our lives in many ways, even when we might maybe not be fully conscious of it. Some years back, my wife and I, uh, we, did a, we were running a recovery course. Um, back in those days, the recovery courses, a lot of churches were running them. And I remember this one particular lady that came to the course, very damaged in her life, had been through three or four different relationships, a lot of abuse had occurred in these relationships. And Fleur and I were sitting and discussing with her about some of this, and she made, and she was saying, you know, oh, this, you know, I've just got out of another bad relationship, another, you know, um, he's gone to jail now, thankfully, and I won't have to have him in my life. And, and she said, at least, Fleur, you don't have to worry about stuff like this. You've got Bruce. And Fleur said to her, without even thinking, said, well, you could have someone like Bruce in the future, you know, we could, you know. She said, oh, no, no, that will never happen. And Fleur goes, why, why wouldn't you have... She said, because I don't deserve someone like Bruce in my life. Her worldview or her belief system was that she didn't deserve someone nice in her life, that things that are occurring for her were almost happening because of the things that she uh, had done in her life or the, who she was. You know, we can even extend that thinking sometimes towards God and, and where does God, how do we understand God? And sometimes we can think that, you know, because of my past, because of the things I've done, my failures, my inadequacies, the things that happen, God can't really love me. God really can't care about me. You know, we act congruently with the way we think. Over time, we are a product of our thinking systems. And our thinking systems are, you know, our brains have been recognised that, you know, that we have two things that the brain mainly does. One of us is to survive and the other part is it wants to thrive. So our brain is working all the time on, on those two areas. And people will always be trying to, you know, their thinking will, will fit in those spaces. But sometimes our thinking can go astray. I don't know whether you've ever heard of a guy called Dave Nasir. Dave Nasir uh, was a contestant on a show called Alone. And Alone was a TV show where people would it was go out and survive in a, a terrain. Um, and they would put contestants out by themselves and they would monitor them and check in with them and do health checks and all sorts of things. And they'd give them a, a small range of survival tools and they had to go out and sort of live by themselves in this survival thing. Well, Dave su survived 73 days. But by the end, they had to actually take him out from a medical point of view because he'd lost that much weight and he was getting close to, to malnutrition uh, because he'd... Uh, organised to only eat one bit of salmon every week. That was his plan of how he, he caught salmon and he was going to have one, one salmon every week, spread it across the week, and that was how he was going to survive. Lasted 73 days doing this. Now, the interesting thing was that he'd also stockpiled another 75 salmon that was smoked and ready to eat, but in his mind, if I'm going to win, I can only have one piece of salmon a week. Even though he had salmon, that could have lasted him another 75 days, having one, pe one salmon a day. Um, but in his mind, he'd convinced himself that this was the way he needed to win. Sometimes surviving can get in the way of thriving when we don't think correctly. Some of our thinking is also based around what they call our universal needs. And we're motivated towards achieving those needs. Alan mentioned one last week about our sense of belonging. And that, you know, our need to belong has been recognised that all human beings have this need to belong. And probably the most scariest people in the world are the loners. And again, it's interesting, there was another shooting in the US which was again another loner who felt that nobody cared for him. He, um, you know, he, he was by himself. Sense of belonging can cause people to do things that they wouldn't normally do in other situations, just to belong. We also, the other areas are having a sense of mastery or a skill that is recognised by others. Having a sense of control or ability to make choices or a sense of independence or freedom. 
or having a sense of purpose to our lives that can contribute in some recognised way. All of these are drivers or motivators of our behaviour. The desire to feel good, to be recognised, to have power and control, to belong are all motivators. But sometimes they are also not motivating us in the right way. Henri Nguyen, who was a famous, uh, went into a community of, um, of people that were, you know, with disabilities and actually said he found God in that community better than he'd ever found God outside it. He made the statement, as long as we continue to live as if we are what we do, what we have and what other people think about us, we will be filled with judgments, opinions, endeavours and con- condemnations. We will remain addicted to the need to put people and things in their right place. Our self-judgment, our tendency to tell ourselves we are not enough, is the nidus out of which grows our judgment of others. To the degree that we can embrace the truth that our identity is not rooted in our success, power or popularity, but in God's infinite love, to that degree, then we can let go of the need to judge. What a powerful statement that our lives, that we see ourselves needing to be this or do that or that, to be recognised and have importance. And yet God says we have importance and we are loved at the base of it. You know, most of us are aware that we have faults and flaws and a lot of these beliefs override us stepping out and doing the things that we would want to do. Sometimes at the back of it are a whole bunch of different things that get in the way of us doing the things that we plan on and goals that we think we're going to live out for. A good friend of mine, uh, acquaintance, Scott Larson, who uh, he lives in the US, uh, he's the founder of a, and president of, of a pr- youth prison ministry called Straight Ahead Ministries. He was doing some training for an organisation I ran in Melbourne um, and he made this little training, he made this little statement um, that I found really beneficial in in this idea. He said when he first became a parent, he remembered sitting down and saying, I want to be a really great parent. I want to be that type of parent that's there with my kids. I want to be, you know, there in the quality times, you know, sharing with them and helping them grow and helping them become, uh, you know, everything they need to be in this life. And he said, that was the goal in my mind. That was what I was planning to do. And he said it was some years later when his kids were in their teens and he was looking at it and he was reflecting on that and thinking, well, that didn't really happen the way I thought. What went on? And so he did a bit of thinking about these beliefs. And one of the things he realised was, one belief he had was that making money for the family was his responsibility as the man. And therefore, it was important that he went out and did that. And so he was doing his job as a man, as a parent in in that he was bringing home money to the family and if he had to spend time on it to make it work well that was the sacrifice he would make to to bring that you know money into the house he also recognized that in his thinking he thought well my spouse is she's really good at doing this she looks after the kids really well she does it naturally it's something i haven't forced you know i I struggle with it she does I'll, i'll let her do it more of it than me he also believed he really wasn't good at being a parent. He hadn't had a good role model. His dad had not been a good father to him. And he struggled to work out how to actually meet the needs of his kids, to be there for them and to spend time with them in a positive way. And he said, I probably, in my thinking, I was thinking I probably did more harm than good when I spent a long time with them. And he also recognised that he got more significant and recognition for his work outside the home than he got inside the home. And so he was drawn to that because that was where he felt good about himself. So sometimes, you know, there's a whole bunch of thinking that goes underneath us about stops us stepping out into who we want to be. A.W. Tozer, American pastor, author and leader, he said, were we able to extract from any man or woman a complete answer to the question, what comes to mind when you think of God? we might predict with certainty the future of that man or woman. What a powerful thought, you know, that how we understand God in our life, how we understand God in in and around our relationship with him impacts how we behave and act. 
Do we understand that we have a God that loves us? Do we have a God understanding how much God wants good for us in our lives? When we surrender our lives to him, he, it says he puts our old selves to, to death and we have a new creation. We become something new. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19, it says, Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. We are made new, we were transferred new. But we have to actually appropriate this into our life this new identity. A lot of theologians have suggested that we actually have two different spaces. One is we have a legal position where now we now declared that we are in God, we've made new, that we have a position without sin, that we've made righteous, that we are loved, that we are cared for. Um, but we also have another position where we are still trying to attain and work up towards becoming all of that things that we legally have become. The closest, this is a bit, not a great analogy, but the, the, I was thinking of the closest I could get is, you know, like when someone becomes a naturalised citizen of Australia, or straight away, legally, they get all the, all the stuff that a citizen of Australia gets. They can apply for work, they can, you know, they'll get benefits from the government, they can use our health system, they can, you know, there's a whole bunch, they get the vote, whether that's a benefit or not, I don't know. Um, but... It, they get all the requirements that they get as being a legal citizen of Australia. But not everybody straight away getting naturalised will act as if they are an Australian citizen. Sometimes their culture gets in the way, sometimes their past experience, sometimes things that have occurred in their life stop them acting and believing that they have all the requirements to live as an Australian. We need to think differently if we want to live differently. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to this pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Part of that verse is saying renew your mind. And it is a, it's not something that says that it occurs in a one-time thing. It actually is a, the verb is indicating it's an ongoing constant process that we have to continually bring our lines, minds into line with God and renew them in the way that God thinks. One of the things God says about us when we make a decision to become a Christian, when we pray generally to receive Christ, we are instantly made into full-fledged sons or daughters of God. We are joint heirs with God. John 1.12 but to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Galatians 3.26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. 2 Corinthians 6.18, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 1 John 3.1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And having a right understanding of that cannot be overstated. We've been made a new person and in Christ we are being made sons and daughters of God and given a new life. You know, Paul in his letters, must, he mentions or references more than 200 times this idea of us being related to God as a child. And so it must have, if Paul writes it so strongly, it must have some importance that we need to grab hold of it. The other interesting thing is that when Paul writes his letters, the first half of most of his letters are just full of who God is, who we are, and the relationship that is now established. The first 11 chapters of Romans are all about who God is and who we are. And that's only after he gets through 11 chapters, then he gets to chapter 12, he says, therefore, this is how you should act. First three chapters of Ephesians, the same way. First two chapters of Colossians, four chapters of Galatians, first chapter of Philippians, all start with who we are, who God is, and how, what that relationship actually is. The, it starts different, you know, as we've got this worldview that, you know, we, we, do, we 
we do things first or we have things and then we do things and then we become. That, you know, our lifestyle is all around recognising that, you know, the things we do is what gives us identity. And God comes along and says, no, understand this. It is who you are and then you get to do and then you get to have. And that is a powerful change. It's a powerful difference to what we're used to. Some people have suggested that we, aren't, we hear these words that we're a child of God and that we're sons and daughters, but we still live in what was called an orphan com- complex or a syndrome. You know, um, Alan has mentioned in other weeks, you know, like he could tell, you know, a first child, a last tr- a youngest child, you know, they all give out certain characteristics. Um, and people, children from large families versus single, you know, only kids, they all have different characteristics that they tend to put out. And kids from an orphan point of view tend to put out similar characteristics as well. So if we, if we live in an orphan viewpoint of our relationship with God, some of the things that come out are things like um, having things is important, holding on to things, clinging to people instead of God. Fighting for the rights, fearful of God's wrath and God being harsh and angry. Defensive around their self, feeling like an outsider, not belonging or gaining or joining in search for this. Confused about their true identity. Feel neglected by those who are around them and that they don't don't really care. Lack a future hope and vision for their life. Tend to be performance orientated. Can often feel lonely, isolated, critical of others, judgmental, unwilling to ask for help and assistance and find it difficult in receiving and giving love. Orphan conflicts. It's a mindset, it's a belief that people can hold and sometimes we hold it with God that we don't measure up, that we're not important enough. Merely telling people that you're a child of God won't change that deep underneath feeling for many people. They know who they are. They know the things that they've done wrong. They know their things that have not worked out the way they should. They know their failures, their inadequacies. And they say, oh, how could God love me? We have such a strong psychological system of thinking and that's designed to protect us and it's about survival. We're great spin doctors, rationalisers, justifiers and faced with information that doesn't fit with our worldview, we will find ways of pushing it away and saying that can't be really what it is. And often that occurs outside of our daily awareness, in our deep subconscious area. Do we accept that God loves us and that he calls us his child? Can we live in that framework? I'm going to suggest a different way of looking at it. I'm going to suggest when you think along the lines that I don't measure up, that I'm not good enough, I'm going to say, you're right. None of us do. None of us do. None of us measure up to God's holiness. None of us measure up to his standard. We all fall short. But when he says he makes us our adopted son and daughter, it's not through anything we have done It's everything through what he has done. We can have those things that God has for us because of what Jesus has done for us. In Christ, all that is true in Christ is is now true for us as well. It doesn't originate from or through us. We have been adopted by faith, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. We simply submit, surrender to it. We don't create what is true about us, but at the benefit we must yield and align everything within us to this truth. God has given us access to the divine life so that we might join him in this life and do what he is doing, or at least our portion of the good work that he's prepared in advance for each one of us. We become vessels of love and grace and power that God can use for his glory. I like Strong's version of grace where it says, 
It's a divine influence upon the human heart and its reflection in the life. What a great thing that we are given that grace, the divine influence into our life to reflect it in our life. We have a life that God has prepared for us as his sons and daughters and he's, co- and he's pulling us back to take hold of that life and become everything he wants us to be. Everything we not need starts with Jesus and the only reason we have access is because of Jesus. We need to understand that as a child of God, as a son or daughter of God, we are given everything. 2 Peter 1, 3, 4 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his great, very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. He has given us everything we need to walk out into the life that he has prepared in advance for us to have. This is who we are. This is who we are called to be first. Be be a child of God. Take a hold of it, appropriate it, stand in that space. This is my legal position. I am given all these things. Then I do things in that power and then I will have the things I need to step out and do the things with God. Matthew 10, 39 says, When we give up our lives for him, we find life. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's the life God wants for each of us. He wants us to be a child and daughter of God and stand up in that and then do things as a result of that. Not try and do things out of our own power or for meet our own needs. I want to finish with uh, one of my favourite phones by Marianne Williamson. Uh, it was actually used by Nelson, Nelson Mandela used it um, in his inauguration speech. It's called Our Deepest Fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our fear, our presence automatically liberates others. 